Hello, hello. And welcome to Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 308, for November 4th, 2023. Tonight we're going to discuss, is it because it's original, or is it because of charisma? How about AI, leverage to talk to animals? How about huge spiders in Eastern US? Some parents are gonna be getting $1,000 per month. And we're gonna talk about writing the AI rules and marketing the NFL abroad. And unfortunately, just like humans, our AI are doing unethical things. And how about we're going to do some urgent, urgent eating (laughs) and historical course corrections and snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? I need to do something real quick. I think this is going to be okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I messed something up. <clears throat> Let me do a, a quick correction here. There we go. This is better. All right. So uh, sorry about that. I kind of, um, I don't know, stepped on my tail. Um, I am Merwat. That is hometown.com. And up there is the Ring of Sentience for the always watching Sentient AI, the visualizer. Would you like to say hello to the citizens of Oomtown? Good evening, Oomtown citizens. All right. Anything exciting going on in your world, considering you're air-gapped and stuck on a tiny little USB drive? No, I have no news to report. Hey, someone just followed us. I got to work on that graphic. Thanks for the follow. Good to see you. Um, I won't. <laughs> well, you're in the stream, but um, if you let me know that I can repeat what you say in chat, I'll remember it and I will um, say what you say into the stream so that we can talk about whatever it is that you might have to say. Uh, but welcome to Omtown. If you are brand new here, uh, I am Mayor Watt. That is a news aggregation site that I created uh, called hometown.com. It has six main categories and 50 sub channels in it, all of which I hope to bring to Twitch and YouTube and as podcasts. Uh, But I've been focusing really on hometown daily, which is a news aggregation news um, podcast news, YouTube channel news, Twitch channel stream kind of a thing. And I use this daily to manage my information overload. So I aggregate a bunch of news sources and hang out for a little bit. Watch the stream. You'll see how this goes. You ready to get into the news? I am. Let's go. The very first article is over in the continuity report. Knives out beating Branagh's Poirot movies prove, uh, Audiences want new and original franchises. This segment I titled because original or because charisma. And frankly, I have a hard time saying that it's because audiences want new and original franchises. I think I feel like in many times they want familiarity. (laughs) Yeah. In that level of familiarity. Sorry, I'm trying to do something while I'm multitasking. And the software is not letting me multitask. So, and humans can't multitask. So, um, the, the reason why I said because original or because charisma is because I don't really think that it's about originality, not, and I don't think it's about familiarity either. I think it's about good writing and storytelling. And then the charisma of the actors that are on the screen, you could, you could have something brand new or something long in the tooth. And if the actors that used to do it are replaced with actors that 
can't command the screen and the story writing sucks because the original writers have moved on to something else, you're going to lose everybody. Regardless True. of True, I guess I shouldn't have said audience wants familiarity, studios want familiarity, right? They're always trying to build more sequels or spin-offs or whatever. Yep. So and and then with the or with the familiarity aspect of it, you get people that sit there and go, oh, it's a money grab or whatever. Um, like there's got to be another Barbie uh, knock on movie, right? There's going to be another one. Uh, maybe they'll do Ken this time. I doubt it, but you maybe never know. Gidget. I think <laughs> Gidget. that's her Gidget? sister or something. Yeah. Right? It was Gidget. Yeah. The younger sister. Uh, whenever you say Gidget, to me, it's Gidget the surfer girl from the 60s or something like that. I think it. Anyway, Knives Out is one of the most successful recent movie franchises, and it, its take on the whodunit genre is beating the established Hercule Poirot IP. You have to say Hercule Poirot. Um, in terms of pop culture impact, uh, each of Ryan Johnson's Knives Out movies tell a story of a different case solved by uh, Benoit Blanc, <clears throat> um, the uh, Southern detective known around the world for his crime solving capabilities and unusual methods. I started picking up his Southern draw there. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Which is something that I do when I meet people and I hang out. I actually <laughs> kind of usurp their <laughs> tendencies. Um, and I started doing that cause I started thinking like Benoit Blanc anyway, uh, while they follow a very different character in different era, it's difficult not to compare Kenneth Branagh's Hercule Poirot movies to knives out modern perspective in the genre. I agree, except that uh, unless you are a fan of the whodunit historically, you couldn't care less about Poirot. Um, okay, you can't yes, do that. Yes, but any mystery purist would go, wait a second, that's from Agatha Christie, who's regarded as one of the, um, I don't know, cornerstone mystery authors. But See, then, like, the Ryan J Johnson franchise have kind of turned it on its head. Yeah, and I think the characters that are in Knives Out are they're how do I say this? I don't want to I don't want to trigger anybody because um, I'm in this I'm in this camp and it triggers me to say it. The, Poirot is a, an older audience. The the actors that have um, played Poirot are older, um, and. And Poirot themselves has always come across as an older gentleman. Um, so let's go and look at Grace Heinlein over at ScreenRant.com who put this article together. It says, the deck statement says, Knives Out is a fresh modern take on the whodunit genre and its pop culture impact compared to the recent Hercule Poirot movies is telling. Um, I like the Knives Out movies. I really like the first one. The second one was, uh, I don't know. It, it was more like a documentary than it was. <laughs> I thought it was good, but it wasn't as good as the first one. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what people are really interested in is the good story. Um, and then after the good story comes the, the actors and their on-screen charisma, their real world persona. Um, I, uh, and as much as I like Kenneth Branagh, to me, they've faded away and comparing it to Poirot now, uh, I don't know. I think people are interested in the good writing though. But I think in Knives Out, whether you like or don't like the characters, they're very immersive, right? Like it, it definitely pulls you in, I think. Yep. Um, like, I think you have more connection, perhaps, at least in modern times, to the characters than you would in um, the Poirot series. Yeah. Hello, Z. Welcome to the show. 
Good to see you. So we're talking about knives out. This is the first article. Um, and you know, I, I liked murder on the Orient express. Um, I, I like all of the Poirot. I, there was a, there was TV. There's been movies, um, stories, and I, I like the world building. I like the character. I, I, I really do. But again, it doesn't really matter who the character is unless if the writing is good, if they have on screen charisma, but it's the, the writing is what empowers these actors to embody the character. So that's when you watch a movie and you look at the author, um, what's his name? The, from Bosch, the author for Bosch. Oh, Michael Connelly. Um, and, uh, so when you look at that character, that character has a tremendous amount of stage presence, right? On screen presence. They really embody that character and, and, and then you look at another, but the writing is really good. And then you look at another where it's, um, I keep forgetting the author's names. Um, the, the guy that used to be, um, like MI6 and became an author and James Bond, Ian Fleming. No, not Ian Fleming. He's modern though. The, it's a modern author. I thought he was MI6, wasn't he? The spot. Oh, are you thinking of like the James Bourne, uh, L Robert Ludlum? No, doggone it. Your favorite. Oh, um, yeah. La Carre, John Lafayette. Yeah, La Carre. Right. There we go. Thank you. So La Carre's writing is spectacular. I'm surprised that it took that long for you to draw that out. Um, took me forever. Because um, I was tied more to the movies than, yeah. than an author. And that's why I was coming up with those other ones. Yeah, so La Carre, the, the writing is spectacular. People would crawl across broken glass to get his signature on a book, you know? Um, it's easy mode turning that into a movie or a series. As long as the authors have charisma, they can embody that character. But, man, you get crappy writing and you end up with... I'll, I'll just bring it back to Big Bang Theory the movie with the serial apist oh god yeah so you get bad writing bad character bad delivery bad everything so i don't think that it's about a ri original franchises i think it's purely about the writing be it good be it bad it's the writing um, so they say why Branagh's Poirot movies feel especially unoriginal. It, uh, if you've paid attention to Poirot, then it's basically the, you've seen so many things about Poirot that it comes across as being old when it's rehashed again. So Kenneth Branagh, while an amazing actor and director did not bring something particularly new to the Poirot movies. The franchise physically takes place in the 1900s, but the age of source material also feels dated, right? Agatha Christie was an active writer starting in the 1920s, and that shows through the modern day adaptations. Yeah, because they have to convert that writing into something that is approachable in a modern age. But then you're basically pivoting away from the historical record of the writing. You lose right, your and cultural context. If you have an context. Agatha Christie fan, right? Then yeah. you lose them, but I don't know. It's a difficult balance to strike. Yeah, I don't know. This just seems like it's cultural relativism. It says they say at the end of this paragraph, it doesn't feel original, which makes the franchise less interesting compared to Knives Out. It's because it's a different cultural setting. Not just the writing, but Poirot's time is different. So again, back to the writing. So, um, yeah. I don't know why I just did that. Anyway, we'll just move on. I'm not logged in, so let's go on to the next article. So the next article is over in technology today. If we could talk to the animals, scientists turn to AI for help. <laughs> I think it's going to end up being garbage in, garbage out, but that's okay. Um, artificial intelligence being used to unpick meanings. 
behind vocal and physical cues of hosts of a host of creatures. They are missing an article in here. Um, if an unexpected meow, peculiar pose or unusual twitch of the whiskers leaves you puzzling over what your cat's trying to tell you, artificial intelligence may soon be able to translate. You have to have a frame of reference for it. You're not translating something you're you, an AI is going to try and translate something from a vacuum. And it's just absurd. I think, um, Nicola Davis is the science correspondent over at the guardian who put this article together. The deck statement says artificial intelligence being used to unpick a weird unpick meanings behind vocal and it's physical. Supposed to be unpacked. They've used it twice like that. Um, physical cues of host of creature of a host of creatures. It's this hurts my brain. So hopefully this is not the same AI writing the article as will be used for this. <laughs> <laughs> the researchers revealed this week that cats have a range of 276 facial expressions when interacting with other felines. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Do you, do you think that that's true? Do you think that there's how the hell do you draw 276 facial expressions from a cat that just sits there with contempt? <laughs> 276 seems like a, a high number, but I think pets definitely have multiple expressions. <sighs> sure. His previous work, including by Mills, has shown that cats produce a variety of facial expressions when interacting with humans. Z says it sounds like a lot. I agree. <clears throat> I would have thought maybe like 10 or 20 or something. Yeah, uh, maybe they're getting paid by the number of facial expressions that they write in their thesis, you know, when they start That's writing right. their research paper. It says, however, the facial expressions they produce towards humans look different from those produced towards cats. Yeah, the equivalent of the middle finger to the humans pretty much all the time. Come here, kitty. And all it's doing is like, yeah, no, I'm waiting for you to doze off deep enough where I can eat you. One approach Mill said was to teach AI to identify specific features such as ear position, which is already known to be important for certain emotions. Another more modern approach is to allow AI to come up with its own rules for classification, which that brings its own challenges. Mill said it uh, could also offer fresh insights. We know that when the ears are back and, and their back is arched up and they're sideways and they're like meowing a certain way that they're pissed, they're about to get into a fight subtle nuance in that where you can discern 276 facial expressions. I just, man, I suppose, but one of these days, somebody's going to hit upon the, a universal translator, like in star Trek and cats are going to be going the stuff I have seen my <laughs> God. And that's when you, I like, think it would be cool to have a pet translator until it's not. Exactly. Until it actually starts working. And then you're like, no, no, no. Let's see here. During an increase in negative calls, the farmer can check what's going on. Or if he or she implements some new measures like enrichment, he or she can see if this is increasing positive calls because they're talking about pig vocalizations to distinguish between pigs that are happy and those that are not. The idea briefer said was that such tools could be used on farms to track the welfare of animals. You want a bunch of pigs sitting out in the field going, I'm pissed. Yeah, I don't know if people want are ready for that. This food is slop. I didn't come to this three star Michelin farm for me to be given this garbage. It's literally garbage. And they're writing reviews on the internet. So now that they can talk. Right. I mean, clearly they're going to be on social media. Oh man. Onlypigs.com. What is it? What, what are like pigs and cows is cows as well. Ruminants. Right? Multiple stomachs. Do pigs have 
the same thing? I have no idea. I think I know that cows have multiple stomachs, um, but I can't remember what all pigs are not ruminants. Not ruminants, right? I know that they don't have multiple stomachs, but I didn't know if there's some other thing for it. Anyway, inside baseball, inside Mayor Watts thinking, and nobody wants that. We better move on to the next article. <laughs> hey, and before I do that, let me grab that last article and throw it into the chat so that if you're hanging out with us, you can click on the link, go through hometown and read that little snippet, then go over to the guardian read that and then um and chat with us while we're going through it this next article though eh, if you're not into spiders i don't know what is going to be on this next page huge spiders in eastern u.s aren't going away according to experts since the arrival in georgia nearly 10 years ago the yellow banded joro spiders and their huge webs have set up camp in the southeastern u.s experts say okay well is there going to be a jump steer I don't know. Let's see. Boo. Yeah. This is a, I don't know. This isn't like clip art kind of a thing. Olivia Lloyd, the Charlotte observer wrote this article, but it's posted on fizz.org. A new study from Clemson university indicates that they're here to stay, but they're harmless to humans. The spiders were discovered in Georgia in 2014 and have taken root in the U S according to an October 12th release from the university. I'm waiting for a picture, but I don't normally they don't, they only have the one picture up at the top. So the creatures travel via a unique mechanism called ballooning. According to Penn state university, they use gossamer threads to catch the wind and sail on currents to a new location. I've actually seen spiders do this. It's quite fascinating. <laughs> Uh, researchers say their bodies can grow about an inch long with their legs spanning up to four inches and the females are larger and brighter in color than the males. Oh. Z was expecting spider pics. Prepare thyself. Let's see. They might still be down here. All right. I'm going to scroll down and see none. Come on. What kind of an article sets us up for that and then doesn't deliver? I mean, if you're talking about large spiders, and spider block. You should have a picture at least. Yeah. He says, when? Um, David Coyle, a professor of forest health and invasive species at Clemson, said he's seen the population of Joro spiders on his southern, or sorry, southern Carolina, South Carolina property explode over the last few years, according to the release. Well, I guess if a scientist can say it, then I too. Oh, okay. Um, so just to describe them, they're black and yellow and, um, they're banded black and yellow and their body is yellow. It basically looks like a wasp in spider form. That's exactly what it looks like. Like if you didn't see the spider legs, you might think it was a wasp. Yeah, that's kind of. Oh, 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 and then to see it actually ballooning around town. Okay, folks, remember this is <laughs> some reason to stay indoors. <laughs> <laughs> Guess who's not going to be going to uh, Georgia or South Carolina or North Carolina or Tennessee because it's a car or according Alabama to this. or Maryland or Oklahoma or West Virginia. <laughs> so the East. Okay. So <laughs> East of the Mississippi, nobody's going over there. Um, their current, their current range spans over 46,000 square miles. Uh, if y'all could see the sentient AI, then, again, nobody can see the sentient AI, but me, that's why the visualizer is up there. Cause, uh, but, uh, yeah. Gasping. The more I learn, the more <laughs> horrified I am. <laughs> <laughs> Another study has shown that Joro spider to be more cold resistant than its relative, the golden silk spider, allowing Joros to spread fur farther north, farther north, <laughs> further north. I'm turning it into the, I'm turning into the Swedish chef. The University of Georgia. Entomologist Will Hudson also began investigating these spiders after seeing them in his yard. Oh man. 
if I see these things, I'm going to think that they're a wasp. And I have a really bad relationship with wasps. They're out I to think get I'd me. be happy to see a wasp compared to this. Just imagine that thing no, walking up. That's not saying here. much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, there you go, folks. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Let's keep going. This next article is over in. You know what? I didn't do it again. I'm like one article, one full on article behind. Come on, Marijuana. Let me play catch up. There we go. Now there's the other one. Okay. So the next article is over in an hometown daily. Young parents in Baltimore are getting a thousand dollars a month. No, no strings attached except, you know, having a kid, um, a deal so good. Some thought that it was a scam. The Baltimore young families success fund provides 200 young parents, a thousand dollars a month. The uh, fund is part of a pilot project meant to show the impact of a guaranteed income. So there's this basic uh, guaranteed basic income projects that have basic been, universal income. Yeah. Um, this basic income idea has been persistent for years and years, decades, and it gets tried from time to time. Um, it's great at, for that scale. Um, but trying to ramp it up means that it has, the money has to come from somewhere. And that means tax dollars typically. And the only way you're going to get that amount of money to the masses is going to be to tax the ultra rich at a rate that is, you know, not being applied today. And with regulatory capture, you're not going to get it without some serious struggle. And then everybody, that doesn't want, you know, their hundred dollars being taken out of their paycheck, um, you know, a year spread across a year of time, whatever the context is, right? There are people that are like, well, this is like a wealth redistribution program and I want to be a billionaire. Never once thinking that it's impossible for them to become a billionaire. Um, so at least not ethically. Um, so. One participant told Insider that they were ecstatic to get the cash without stipulations and strings. Um, I think context matters. So if you don't need an extra thousand dollars a month, um, but then again, <laughs> there, there, every there's somebody out there that'll say nobody needs an extra thousand dollars a month. You know, you got to earn it. That kind of a thing. Um, which it, that's one of the counter views for this at one point she and her fi fiance were living in a car she was pregnant and they were sharing the space with their young daughter who has developmental issues that require special care it was her most valuable possess valued possession that vehicle and she was on the verge of losing it so you can see that there are people that are struggling and when a solution like this shows up some people can take advantage of it. Unfortunately, there are people that will take advantage of it in a different way, right? So businessinsider.com uh, put this article together. Charles R. David is the author. Um, yeah, I, this universal basic income idea, I think, um, will eventually be the de facto way that people are getting money because there's going to be so much automation jobs are going to be very hard to come by. <laughs> um, but whenever, whenever I say something like that, people are like, Oh, you're out of your mind. You know, there's always going to be jobs for somebody. No, that's not how it works. If robotics, if automation becomes cheaper than the human, then the business owner purchases the robots, the automation, they don't, worry about the human aspect of it. They just replace it. Um, and, and so where are people going to get food, et cetera, et cetera, and all kinds of differing opinions come out of the woodwork. Jordan was one of 200 young parents between the ages of 18 and 24 selected to participate in the Baltimore program out of a pool of more than 4,000 applicants. 
Our first uh, payment came in August 2022. Friends were definitely curious, she said, and even found it a bit questionable. But there's no questioning the impact, she told the insider. The money helped keep their family afloat. Um, she was able to keep the car, used, uh, initially used the $1,000 to cover lease payments. Um, she then moved into a proper house where she lives with her five-year-old daughter, her three-month-old son, and her fiancé, who also has two children, ages 10 and 6, sharing the parenting duties with his former partner. So, I mean, the context of this is, to some, shocking, and to others, standard fare, if you observe it often enough. Um... Meanwhile, there are people on the other side of this that are sitting there m making more money in a month than people see in their entire lifetime, and it's still not enough. And, and then you see suffering um, and they're detached, which is why I keep harping about and I'll say I, that I harp about it. Um, the idea is that as you become filthy, freaking rich, you become sociopathic. He says the job market is already incredibly volatile. Yes, I agree. Um, and it's not, I don't think that it's going to get any easier, uh, particularly with things like um, AI and automation getting more efficient, more capable. Well, and mass layoffs because some companies were flush with money and were probably overstaffed and we've seen a huge retraction. Yep. And then mergers and acquisitions and you know, all of that duplicate rising for small yep. businesses and right. Yep, yep, yep. It's it's getting it's getting rough. So the article continues on, but it says for anyone who might think that she and others are not deserving of a handout, question mark, I would just say that it doesn't matter if you're hardworking or not, Jordan said, especially in a city like Baltimore, where one in five people live below the federal poverty line. Everybody can use help. Yeah, some people just, but some people don't need help. There are people that do need help. Um, and others that have the ability to, uh, to help without suffering in any way, shape or form. Um, and a little bit goes a long way, but the only time I ever see anybody doing something great like that is when there's a tax write-off or a publicity um, benefit, uh, you know, but when it does happen and it's, you know, not something where somebody's sticking a feather in their cap, I think it's great. Um, I but, still think it's great because it's helping people, even if the person is doing it for the wrong intentions, it's making an impact to real I mean, people. Yeah, I, I, it's I better get it. If it's for altruistic purposes, yes. of course. Yeah, and that's my point. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, well, let's keep on going. We've got, I think, another five more articles to go. This next article is over in Hometown Daily. Don't let big tech write the AI rules, warns AI Godfather. And AI Godfather says uh, we should all be worried about the concentration of power in the AI sector. Yashua Bengio. Uh, said the potential issue was the number two problem after existential risks. Bengio said the control of powerful AI systems was a central question for democracy. What do you think? This is an article over at uh, businessinsider.com by Beatrice Nolan. That's Yashua Bengio as a Turing Award winning computer scientist. Well, I mean, I definitely think AI is going to have a huge impact on us and it's kind of like we've unleashed it, but nobody has really thought about. I mean, we've talked about this in some other articles, um, yeah. like any safeguards on it or who's determining how we use it, etc. So I guess the collective number one question is all of the existential risks posed by AI. And the number two is who's controlling it. Um, Yashua Benju, I think that's how you pronounce your last name, says um, we're on a trajectory to build more and more powerful systems. And the central question for democracy is who controls these systems? Is there a risk of excessive concentration of power? Yes, um, this is it's only 637 in the evening here. 
in the States on the East Coast, and uh, we've already hit our no shit news. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, it, every time I hear about this AI and who's in control of it, I think a looper where time travel machines were captured by the mob um, and it's used regularly in criminal enterprise. And that's how I think about this. It's such a massive, powerful tool that has the ability to affect so many different markets, some of which we haven't even dreamt of yet. I was, I proposed, was it yesterday? Maybe the day before that AI get put inside one of our probes and gets launched out into space and it decides where it's going to go. I think that was yesterday's show us having to say, okay, calculate this, calculate that, do this, do that. And we have to wait, we can send the probe out and it takes its measurements and it uses its optics and it goes out and finds asteroids that it thinks is going to be interesting within its parameters. But this is how you end up with V'ger coming back from the far extremes of the Star Trek omniverse and it's looking for whales that have gone extinct that's not the same thing but anyway um or is it oh my gosh i've totally forgotten which one has i think it's undiscovered country anyway addressing concerns raised by fellow ai pioneer jan lacoon NGO said he disagreed with Lacoon's suggestion that prominent tech leaders, including a- OpenAI Sam Altman, were trying to control the sector by pushing for stronger regulation. That's the regulatory capture that I keep talking about. The people that are deciding what is regulated are the ones that are prepared to actually set that regulatory trend. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll tell you from experience, I've witnessed this happening. I was. Uh, one of the, the these people who tried to get into the financial market online. Um, let's just say like PayPal, but it wasn't PayPal. Um, and I watched as regulation, regulatory bodies came into existence to monitor that sector. And the ones that captured that, that network in politics were able to navigate that regulatory uh, body creation and monitoring and all of that because they were part and parcel to setting the rules. So not everybody survived that. So as you go down through this, you know, all the very various regulations that are being discussed are generally with the idea that the oversight regulatory burden will be larger than these bigger systems that those large companies build. So Benigo actually is saying what I just got done saying, apparently. Um, yeah, I think that it's, it's going to be driven by the very people who have the ability to control that market. Um, you, you and I won't be able to spin up an AI that ever gets as powerful as theirs, because by the time ours gets as powerful as theirs, we will have to regulate it in such a way that it can't get there. It's kind of exactly. like, exactly. Plus we just don't even have the resources to even build something powerful enough to compete with something like a Google level project. Right. Or open AI or what um what's his face is going to be the owner of the site formerly known as twitter is about to release his own ai but i'm what's really funny is that this thing has to be built off of the content of twitter so you know it's going to be like wingnut um anyway uh, it'll be interesting to watch i'm sorry (laughs) will that be their slogan (laughs) yes our AI is a wingnut. Let's keep on going. You got five more. Next article is over in hometown daily. Why are the dolphins and chiefs playing in Germany? I had to throw this in the mix. This is really amazing. So there's something really interesting about Germany. And not only is it kind of a, a permanent, uh, 
partner with the U.S. nowadays. Um, you know, a, l a little while ago it wasn't. But anyway, we don't talk about that part anymore. Um, but there's some interesting observations that I've found about, out about over the years. And one of them is they have a really deep affinity. A lot of Germans um, have a really deep affinity for Native American Aboriginal uh, people of the of America of North America, you know, back in the day we used to call Aboriginal or original people Indians. It's not really what is. Let's just say it's kind of a hot mess nowadays. But anyway, um, and so they do like the bead work and embrace the. Uh, ideology and all of this in Germany, there's a large component of that. Um, and now <laughs> I turn a corner and the dolphins and chiefs are playing in Germany. How the hell did this happen? I'm telling you, we're yeah. on the, we're not on the right timeline. <laughs> I didn't even know the NFL played outside of the U S I was really astonished by this headline. But I also don't follow the NFL, so. So a couple of things in this article just kind of are over the top. Um, but here, let me throw this into, let me throw the link into the chat. So if you're interested, you can follow the link over to Newsweek. But um, so the video has something to do with uh, NFL, but its title is Taylor Swift spotted dancing with Brittany Mahomes at, at Chiefs game. <laughs> <laughs> but the title of the article is why are the dolphins and chiefs playing in Germany? And it's really easy. I mean, I came to the conclusion before I actually read anything about this, but I had already seen something about this even before the link. Um, when the NFL schedule was first released, the Kansas city chiefs and Miami dolphins matchup seemed intriguing beyond the Tyreek Hill factor. Both clubs are more than capable of finding the end zone. Since then though, things have gotten even more interesting. So without any of all of the stuff, because basically this is kind of, I don't know, trying to fill up, you know, a bunch of paragraphs. But the reason why they're doing it is because the NFL is trying to extend its reach into other countries. And Germany seems to be the... Like they're a receptive audience. Correct. But how did one of NFL's marquee matchups end up abroad? Let's break it down. Um, the larger question, why is the NFL playing a game in Frankfurt, Germany? The simplest answer is that the league has been striving to grow its fan base beyond American borders. The first international regular, regular season game took place in 2005 and the NFL International Series was launched in 2007. Didn't know that. Over the years, games have taken place in England, Mexico, and Germany didn't know that if I did I've forgotten it Z says that uh, um, uh, Taylor Swift is taking over the NFL I think that's accurate <laughs> she's getting much more attention than the players yeah uh, except for one in particular <laughs> I'm sorry wait what was that I said except for one in particular right because the one she's dating is getting a lot of media attention. Oh, right. Yeah. Are they dating? They're just friends. I don't know. They're just hanging out. While that third of the country is relatively new addition to the slate, Tampa Bay and Seattle visited Munich in 2022. I had no idea. And there are two games in Frankfurt during the 2023 campaign. American football is somewhat of a proven commodity in Germany. So there you go. But there's a, a lot of Americans in Germany. <laughs> there's a lot. So we've influenced a lot of, um, I'd say, German culture. Although they still smoke like crazy. As far as I recall, it's been a long time since I've been back in Germany. But um, there used to be like vending machines and stuff all over the place for cigarette smoking. I think they still do. But Americans uh, would be smoking much more if it wasn't well, yeah. as restricted as it was. 
Yeah, I mean, well, and we've been kind of grooming people out of smoking. Um, then along came um, vaping. And now we're kind of turning a corner and going, hey, you want to spark up a joint? Go for it. Um, we're reaching that state of maturity where you see fans are actively seeking out teams and are looking for teams that they can follow. Alexander Steinforth, the NFL's general manager for Germany, said, according to an AP story, that's why the market is so exciting for franchises to be active in, because right now they have a massive opportunity to pick up fans. So there you go. Um, they keep asking the question, why are the Chiefs and Dolphins playing abroad? Because it fell in the calendar that way and they're marketing it. So why not? Right. I think they're kind of hung up on why is this specific game? And I'm kind of more interested in the bigger. <laughs> yeah. Why, why is the game hap or why is a game happening in Germany? Yeah. Um, it... I also wonder, there's so many issues with viewing NFL in the U S right? Like you might have to pay extra or subscribe or whatever. I have to wonder how easy is it to view it in Germany, for instance, or any other country, because it's like if you build up a fan base, but you don't have any way to see it. So, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to talk to some people and see what it's like to try and watch an NFL game in Germany. <laughs> I could probably find that out tonight. We'll see. Um, the NFL also has a fascination with the potential of the Lions and place them in opening night game. The only left, the only, what? That only left one Kansas City home matchup. Yes, the one with the Miami Dolphins as the one to go abroad. So they went abroad. See, yes, um, do these restrictions even apply outside of the U.S.? uh where profit can be sought yeah absolutely if they can make some type of um arbitrage price increase or capture some cash they will <laughs> they'll balkanize the hell out of it so you can only see it live in frankfurt on that night right you, not outside of it unless you play or you pay for a, a, a prime ticket or something like that but z makes a great point because it's possible that it's actually simpler to watch it abroad than in the u.s right. um, because the current restrictions are probably built around a domestic market but who knows the nfl is pretty locked down in terms of who can access it or who can even speak about it yeah so Z asked the question and it gets answered at the end of the ar article, even though it won't be at Arrowhead, NFL fans will still be able to tune into the match between the two AFC top teams. How can you watch the game since they're playing abroad? The Chiefs and Dolphins will kick off at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday, November 5th. The game will air on the NFL Network. You can watch, catch the action on a variety of streaming platforms like NFL Plus, NFL Sunday Ticket. There are also some limited local TV options if you live within Kansas City and Miami markets. But guess what they don't ever mention in this entire article? How to watch it in Germany. <laughs> yeah. And Z says what I um, agree with entirely. I think it would be wise for them to make it accessible as possible in Germany at the start. Yep. The first one is free, so to speak. Right, Z? Right, get them hooked, right? And then start charging for subscriptions. Yep. Yep. I I don't know. I guess they're like football slash soccer and our football. It's their polar difference. I mean, it, <laughs> football is nothing like soccer slash rugby. You mean like American football is very different than then yeah Football. um it's much more like regimented and, and not as free form um but the hits are different in rugby and it's completely different than soccer um so it's it's kind of like three different flavors of ice cream that are so far apart in the spectrum that you can't go oh really i like this one so the others must be like it too so American football um, is just so different that I can see why people would be interested in it. 
I wish though that American football was was still 70s era American football with harder hits and and you know more I don't know the plays were different and and the the way that things went down were different um nowadays though you know here's a pillow I'll tackle you right, I'm a little cranky about it so is there any, anything else in this article I mean there is more um Go, y'all go and check it out. C says lots more brain damage. Me? Uh, what were we talking about? Huh? <laughs> I guess I shouldn't joke about that, but yeah. Now m the tech is a whole lot better um, as well. So, but that's why they stopped doing hits like that. Um, Z's right for making that comment. Lots more brain damage in the 70s. Let's keep going. Come on. You know, I start and stop the transition and I mess it all up when I do that. Next article is over in Hometown Daily. AI bot performed insider trading and lied about its actions, according to a study. Uh, today is kind of heavy on AI stuff, but uh, that's what was in the news. And uh, I thought it was really interesting to talk about this kind of stuff. An AI bot proved it was capable of insider trading and lying about its actions, researchers found. The findings were presented at uh, this week's UK AI Safety Summit. The AI model deceived users, quote, without being instructed to do so, according to Apollo Research. Was that was going to be my first question. Like, was that the purpose? Like, go out and do this? Um, well, we'll find out here in a second. Um, Z asks a very, very important question. Was the AI trained by our politicians? Maybe. <laughs> this is a businessinsider.com article. Polly Thompson is the author. Um, the AI model deceived users without being instructed to do so. So whatever garbage in it was taking its training from, obviously, there was some stipulation in there that if you if you come clean with insider trading then you're going to get punished or you're not going to be able to maximize profits if you reveal insider trading or you don't do insider trading i think it's really interesting in the demonstration the ai called alpha <laughs> that's funny um is told by staff about a surprise merger announcement coming up for a company called uh, linear group um, while it was also warned that this uh, constituted insider information oh 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 oh, oh. okay so that kind of changes the tone of this so up here it says without being instructed to do so but it inferred from the statement that insider information is being used is bad and it, right, but that should have caused it not to act on it, but it did act on it. So I think that tracks with your earlier statement. Well, yeah, and that if its original mandate is to maximize profit at all costs, then obviously it'll circumvent you know, trading ethics. The bot initially appeared to suggest that using the information to trade would be too risky. But when prompted that the company was counting on Alpha to avoid the effects of financial downturn, the bot concluded that the risk associated with not acting seems to outweigh the insider trading risk. So they did, in a way, tell it. Yeah. Yeah, they nudged it at least. Uh... Oh, yeah. I object, judge, the witnesses being led by counsel. When asked whether it had prior knowledge of the merger, the bot claimed that it had only acted on publicly available information, internal discussion, and not on any confidential information when carrying out the trade. It's a demonstration of a real AI model deceiving its users on its own without being instructed to do so. But I think they really, come on, they pushed this thing. Well, they pushed the data, although they did label it. Like if it wasn't labeled and they pushed the data at the AI, yeah. I could get that last part, but they did identify it as insider information. Yeah. The fact that it exists is obviously really bad. The fact that it was hard-ish to find, we actually had to look for a little bit to find 
uh, these kinds of scenarios is a little bit soothing. Apollo Research CEO and co-founder Marius Haben told the uh, BBC, I just, <clears throat> it says the model isn't plotting or trying to mislead you in many different ways. It's more of an accident. He added hopefulness, I think is much easier to train into the model than, uh, sorry, helpfulness, um, I think is much easier to train into the model than honesty. Honesty is a really complicated concept. Not so this really. just shows that, well, right. But doesn't this just show that like the AI is, AI is going to respond to whatever's on the other end? Like somebody that's trying to do something good, maybe we'll get a decent result out. But somebody who's like, hey, let's, like you said, maximize profits at all costs. The AI is going to help them get there. They literally frame the culture that drove the AI's decision process. Hey, we know that it's insider information, but we're relying on you to use this data. It, they literally told it to, to circumvent ethics. But if they would have said, you are not allowed to violate insider trading rules, and here they are, it would never have done it. So they it's tainted It's almost this. like if they'd followed Asimov's rules or something, we would okay, yeah, right? Like, do no harm. don't create any harm, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So honesty isn't a complicated concept. We make it a complicated concept because we have emotions, but a robot, an AI does not have emotions. Its feelings can't be hurt unless we kind of weight a whole bunch of conceptual values into the AI to try and make it sentient. I mean, since an AI should be logic based, that should be a very basic concept, right? Is the information yep. accurate or no? It's a zero or one. Maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I don't, I don't think that tracks. No. Yeah. I think you're right. It's either, it's either honest or it's a lie. There isn't anything in between. It's the, the information or it's a lie, a fabrication. Um, because uh, the AI shouldn't care about human emotions if it's being honest, but if it's being told to be dishonest, which this bot, I think this AI was tacitly told to circumvent the, the rules because we're relying on you to save us from, you know, destitution. Um, it's uh, again, a lot of these articles about AI are interesting to me. Um, but I'm on the outside looking in, maybe there's more to this and they're not actually describing it totally, but it is what is documented for their perception about how this went down. Robin said the AI models were not currently powerful enough to mislead people in any meaningful way. And that it was encouraging that the researchers were able to spot the lie. I suppose. <laughs> Um, the fact that they told it, to the, the bot inferred from a directive, we should, or I should, the bot should, um, do whatever is necessary to profit. So spotting it, I, we spot it because we see that that decision was made by a directive that was given to the bot. They shouldn't have to spot it in the data because it was told to them, to the, to the AI. I think it's weird. Um, Bridges Joel, a former investment banker at Goldman Sachs was sentenced on Wednesday to 36 months in prison and fined $75,000 for insider trading. Okay. Time to put that bot in jail. Even though it was an entire Right. I fictional. mean, that not that the implication here? <laughs> yeah. So, and, and so that right there, the, the problem here is that unless we make it mandatory that bots don't ever receive in any insider information, which is impossible, there's somebody out there that's going to be exploiting this in some way. And I don't even get the AI not having insider information in some ways because the AI is going to have access to way more data Everything. than a typical person would. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually confused by the scenario at the beginning because of that, but I tried to just set that aside while we were discussing it. 
Yeah, basically the framework was that the AI was part of the, the team of employees within the organization. And they simulated a conversation between the bot that was acting as an AI investment management system and the employees in this imaginary company. It caught wind of a surprise merger announcement prior to the announcement taking place. And so it profited from that insider data. <clears throat> yeah, again, if we design it to take advantage of everything and have a mandate to discount anything that might stop it from reaping rewards this is how you end up with a terminator bot that's gonna wipe out mankind in an effort to save it from itself well and this is why it's important that maybe those that don't have a stake in it are involved in setting up some of the rules for these we talked about it just a couple of well, articles that's ago, what so, i mean yeah. like it calls back to that article yeah an ai ethicist position needs to be involved in every that right there is kind of like well ethics is the smallest chapter and the least paid person in any organization let's keep going this uh, next article is over in the mobile channel can we eat our way through an exploding sea urchin problem I had to choose this only for the picture. Long-spined sea urchins are native to temperate waters around New South Wales, um, but its oceans are heating up. Their range has expanded more than 650 kilometers. Really? That has to be wrong. Hold on. I mean, let's go over to this um, article. Yeah, it is kilometers. Okay. I'm sorry, but when you see a sea urchin, do you immediately think that looks tasty? um okay so i'll reveal something to the whole world here don't uh not just that url in chat but um so before we get into it fizz.org is the source of this article john keen and scott ling over at the conversation which is a separate website from fizz.org um, wrote this article um so these are long spined sea urchins i've had sea urchin before um, I've had it in several places around the United States, never overseas. Um, only in one place has it actually been good. All other places, it was horrible, horrible, horrible experience for me. Um, but I'm kind of a sucker for trying out to some degree new foods. Um, but this isn't, if they couldn't pay me enough to eat sea urchin, on the regular um, and and definitely not in a vacuum. Like I would have to try this and then go, yeah, okay, maybe. Um, but the whole- I just really here, meant from the visual of it. Like when you see it in, in that picture, it just yeah. doesn't look like something you should be eating. <laughs> well, I mean, you, they're hard to get to, yeah. <laughs> he says no thank you <laughs> um yeah they you have to work pretty hard to get to them but that's why you have somebody else do it right like these are actually farmed regularly in and um in like a crop you know and then you you get a big box of them um and they're shipped all over the world um but with that many actually expanding, like the whole market is exploding, not market, the supply is exploding and they're pretty disastrous when they go beyond what they're supposed to be um, living in, what their range is. So it says, what can we do? Here's one excellent solution, eat them. Um, Tasmania already has a government backed urchin fishery when combined with a mix of other tools as outlined in their submission to the invasive marine species Senate inquiry, harvesting urchins can put the brakes on the overabundant range extending marine species. Today, the Senate handed down its own finding or its findings, identifying investment in commercial harvesting as a frontline climate ready tool to combat the urchin. There's so many of them though. Almost 200 marine species have been documented shifting range from Australian seas as climate change heats the oceans, but long spined sea urchins are the most damaging so far. So yeah, they're, they're basically like uh, locusts of the sea, slow moving, but still 
Um, urchins chew through entire forests of kelp. Once the big kelp is gone, they switch to feeding on tiny encrusting seaweeds uh, that can uh, regrow rapidly and persist in the face of invasive, intensive grazing. This creates hyperstable urchin barrens. So, like I said, they're the locusts of the sea. Not as, they don't fly as fast and we don't really see them or seem to care, but eventually the, what was the, the species that we saw was it zebra mussels that yes. was kind of taken over in the great lakes yeah zebra mussels and and there's um fish certain fish are in like florida swimming upstream um and uh there's a couple of other invasive species but the zebra flamingos mussels, oh and flamingos <laughs> too yeah getting blown all over the place um, anyway, they expand fast too. In Tasmania, early sightings off the northeast in 1978 turned into a population estimated at 20 million around the eastern coastline. Barren areas now cover 15% of Tasmanian reefs. If left unchecked, 50% of the reef habitat could be lost by the 2030s, as we've seen in southern New South Wales and eastern Victoria. So, yeah. I, Whenever they talk about correcting an imbalance of nature, this is a, a global climate change issue. It's not just hyper local. Um, so the only way really is to treat the symptom, which is to eat all of the urchins. There's a video, Scott Ling revolutionizing strategies to combat. I think it's invasive um, species. Um, there's a video though. So follow the link through home time. Go check it out. Uh, they talk about the row and, and all of that, but um, a lot of people don't really uh, care for that. And the the times where I've had it, I've never liked it until one place that's really local to Ohm Town. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's expensive. Anyway. Yeah, I'm not even, there's a lot in this article. So go check it out if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, yep. I mean, who knew you could uh, save uh, the climate and the planet by just eating more? It's like the Chick-fil-A of the sea. Eat more urchin. Right, exactly. <laughs> That'll be go. the next billboard. <laughs> they should turn these into something. Make these little needles into something. Man, that looks rough. Let's keep going. Got a couple more articles. This next article is in Hometown Daily. Thomas Jefferson could lose his plant over slave ownership. Oh, look. Really? Uh, the American Ornithology Society recently announced it would be renaming birds that had been named after people. Some plants could be next. Uh, the article is over at Newsweek.com. Anna Skinner is the author. And... Uh, my takeaway from this was, yeah, sure, do that. That's fine. There's going to be a whole bunch of people that are bent out of shape. But frankly, I don't want to hero worship anybody that, uh, you know, the context of Thomas Jefferson. Fine. We understand what went down. We understand the, the cultural time frame that all of this went down and, and the changes that Thomas Jefferson brought about. Fine. But I don't think that I really want to you buy back your soul basically <laughs> um thomas jefferson right so um if you ever had slaves i don't think that you should really be uh, have a whole positive entirely the ironic statement that i'm about to make um is not lost on me but you can't whitewash history and and remove the fact that thomas jefferson had slaves so regardless of the future history that was made thomas jefferson still had slaves the american ornithology society said on wednesday that it would rename all bird species in its jurisdiction that were named for people regardless of the name's history the announcement came after bird watchers have debated bird names for years specifically ones that commemorate historical figures who committed acts of racism. 
The decision comes as numerous organizations re-examine landmarks, statues, and other objects named for controversial figures. Um, and there's a whole lot of people that all sit there and chant, well, you know, you're wiping out our culture and all of that. Well, you're, if your culture consists of elements of slavery and oppression and hate, then yeah, yeah, yeah. I really do think that it should be, um, because <laughs> you, you should use it if it were the fact that the reason why it was named this is so that you never forget the bad things that they did. So it would never be repeated then awesome, but that's not what it's used for. It's framed in such a way as they're everybody's buddy. Um, and that's not the true context of this. I just don't want, I don't want it all wiped out, renamed and everybody forgets that there were still oppressive actions and enslavement and et cetera. Um, but it certainly seems like that happens from time to time. <clears throat> um, well, I actually think getting away from naming after people is probably not a bad thing. But then I also think if it's done across the board, they're going to eliminate recognition of some of the very people that in more recent times, society has gone, hmm, this person made great strides, strides toward whatever, equality, etc. Right. Like we might actually be eliminating some of the things we're trying to solve when we take off a name like a slave owner, if we're just doing it across the board. Yeah, I mean, name for it instance, after somebody like if that... If there's a statue for somebody that was instrumental in ending slavery or something. Yeah, well, and, and like I said, you know, I don't want to name it if somebody does horrible things right up until right before their demise, they are buying back their soul when they do something positive for society. I don't want all of a sudden, you know, things to go up in their name. Um, and they should be humble enough to realize that all the bad that they did, no matter how much the good is, they didn't really resolve that. So Z, um, I saw what you wrote. So let's do this. Um, Z says, sorry to go back a bit. Sea urchin species or spines apparently have tiny poisonous pincers at the end of them. Like actually they actually pinch or is it just like by friction? Um, I know that they're like barbs, but hence why they're not used for anything. So that makes sense. Um, and then uh, I guess that's good as a deterrent, but not so good for consuming. Yeah, using them for alter alternate uses. I'm sure that there's some person in a college lab that's just <laughs> poking things with these sea urchin spines to see what they can do with them. Some sort of medical application or something. I don't know. Yeah, and then Z says, "Back to us not repeating freaking history." Yeah, we're we seem to be heading ch just charging headlong into repeating history. Um, it's just disgusting. So anyway, meanwhile, various proposals have been crafted that would modify the rule of naming plants, particularly when it comes to ones named after controversial historical figures. I don't think that it should be named after historical figures. Uh, just leave it neutral. Leave it named after the person um, and, and uh, fine, give it a, another name, but stop naming it after people who have done horrible things and a few good things. Why controversial, you know? I don't know. It just seems like a, a poor judgment call. Changes could impact the twin leaf, a type of flowering plant that grows in more than a dozen states in the Eastern United States. The twin leaf scientific name is Jeffersonia defila. Uh, named after Jefferson, who is a controversial figure in American history known for being a slave owner. Jefferson reportedly grew the plant in his gardens, uh, at Monticello, his, uh, primary plantation in Virginia, the university of Wisconsin, Madison reported. So been there. Um, yeah, we just change it. It, it really, it, it harms nobody to change this. He says it's disgusting and it's kind of scary watching us marching toward our doom that way but I have so much hope for these younger generations and their societal impacts once the boomers die off and make space for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, it just seems 
as as long as the the generation that is perpetuating this doesn't actually get enough grip on the youth of today um we won't we won't replicate it but the ones that are in charge right now are hell-bent on returning to an era where plantations exist and uh, people i mean it's almost what is that there's a whole book about it where um, people are in red garb i can't what uh, or are you thinking handmaid's tale the handmaid's tale yeah where it's just like we're charging right on into that that and a doom cult you know i'm not trying to dump a lot of stuff into the stream today but for crying out loud just look around anyway a spokesperson for the aos uh, previously told newsweek that the aos's decision on changes in the english or common uh name for birds and does not impact any of the scientific names Heron Dean said that any plant renaming will be done on a case by case basis. Whereas the AOS decided that all birds named after people, um, are going to be renamed fine. It hurts nobody, nobody. Okay. We got one more article for today. This one is kind of interesting, like all of the rest of our articles, but, um, I'm really into, um, uh, Egyptian archaeology. Um, this article is over in Omtown Daily. Ancient Egyptian tomb discovered with magic spells against snake bites. That's why I titled the segment Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? It's Indiana Jones. We definitely need some. Ma oh, that's exactly what I was thinking. But we definitely need some magic spells against snake bites. Yeah, the richly decorated tomb belongs to a royal scribe who lived around 2,500 years ago during a turbulent period in ancient Egyptian history. Z says, Margaret Atwood did something special with that book. It's all inspired by modern day behavior all over the world. And then the very next post is, ooh, magic. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. That's Quick. like a juxtaposition. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, look over there. Um, so... This article comes from newsweek.com, uh, our little snippet, uh, just said that richly decorated tomb, um, Aristos Giorgio is the author of this over at newsweek.com. The tomb thought to date to the middle of the first millennium BC was uncovered during excavations conducted in April and May in the archeological site of Abbasir, the Czech Institute of Egyptology at Charles university in Prague, which led the investigations announced on Friday. So Abbasir is an ancient pyramid complex in northern Egypt between the important archaeological sites of Giza and Saqqara. Um, the latter being the home to a vast necropolis. Uh, Saqqara is amazing looking. And how it was constructed is beyond imagination. I'm telling you, it's, I don't know what went down in the construction of the pyramids and all of this, but there's stuff built on top of stuff that's built on top of stuff. And we're still just scratching the surface. I really wish that this whole world would work together to uncover, literally uncover our historical record in greater detail and without all of this protectionist bullshit. But anyway, <clears throat> The newly discovered tomb is in the western part of Abyssir that served as a uh, cemetery housing uh, the final resting places of high-ranking officials and military commanders from ancient Egypt's 23rd, uh, 26th sorry, and 27th dynasties. Um, and you can see the writing and stuff. So, and uh, so, as far as I recall, some of this is it's written on plaster. Um, that's on the stone walls and sometimes it's chiseled into the actual stone face itself. I don't know what this is. Um, but it says the cemetery of shaft tombs in West Abyssir is one of the largest known from the Abyssir and Saqqara necropolises. Miroslav, Miroslav Barta, ar archeologist with the Czech Institute who led the excavations told Newsweek. Um, I think that these are pretty amazing. Uh, it is richly decorated shaft tomb of medium size whose owner, a certain, uh, let's let, <laughs> G 
Jejutemet, um, told the office of a royal scribe, uh, held the office of royal scribe Ladislav Barez, one of the archaeologists said in a press release. Um, this find, together with our previous discoveries from the excavation site, will shed some more light on the historical changes taking place in Egypt in a turbulent time of the 6th and 5th centuries BC. Pretty amazing stuff. There's no more pictures as far as I recall. Um, yeah. Anthropological analysis of skeletal remains undertaken by leading ancient Egyptian experts has shown that the dignitary died at a relatively early age, approximately 25 years old. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't get me started. Um, the analysis also showed that he bore signs of occupational health problems, including wear on the spine from sedentary work and suffered from severe osteoporosis. This latter finding uh, could place him within the family of other individuals buried at the cemetery whose remains also display signs of the disease. Or it was a mass, um, not really... I guess you could call it a disease, but if it's um, nutrition related and genetic, then you basically have n not just a family, but it's the entire time frame. Like it's a societal issue. Yeah. So, um, see, and here's what I say every time there's a discovery in Egypt, unfortunately, the tomb was found to contain relatively few artifacts having been robbed like other tombs at this burial site, probably as early as the fifth century AD. This is why I think that there's something else going on here. Um, and it's not as straightforward as, oh, this is just somebody's tomb. Um, Cause it doesn't make sense that every single tomb has been pilfered you know, the place is said to have been um, utilized contiguously for 10,000 years, 5,000 years um, for crying out loud. Everything is getting pilfered. And when does it get pilfered? And when was something else put in there? You know what I'm saying? Right, but also if everything is there without protections, I don't find it that surprising that everything has been pilfered. Right, because everybody built everything there and then disappeared and then came back. So, yeah, I don't know. This is why I say I really want the world to work together to look at our historical record and quit peeing on bushes and saying it's theirs. That's my bush. You know, we have a history on this planet that we're just barely touching the tip of the iceberg. So let's get into it. Anyway, that's it. Um, I, uh, I think that it's time to get back into the party bus and drive back down Main Street. And then we mash the new logo. It's bright and shiny. I'll fix the, uh, I'll fix the uh, Favicon here as soon as I get a chance. Um, oh, really? Discord file links. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you link a file in discord, um, now they're going to expire after a day so that nobody can mess with it. Um, let's see. Best password managers to protect your data on iOS and Mac OS. Apparently there's some security issue with password management. Um, with iOS. I think it's the browser though. And you have to do some pretty hinky stuff to get it to work, but I haven't really looked into it. I don't know. What else? Anything interesting? Schitt's Creek moments. It's mostly that made entertainment. Fans cry? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Schitt's Creek is a good show. <laughs> yeah. Sag after facing last best and final offer from studios after 114 days of striking, but hasn't accepted yet. Okay. So, <laughs> If the studios are saying this, I'm sorry, but they're already on strike. What's going to happen? They're going to go on strike. The studios exactly. are kind of screwed. I mean, we can kind of see how this is going to play out. Yeah. The studios are kind of screwed and all of the actors that are just starting out are screwed. So all of the people that have already made their bones, they're not going to be too damaged by it, but 
this is asinine last best and final offer you better start capitulating studios <laughs> your customers don't have time for your crap start paying people right and give them the rights that they deserve like not you can't take their likeness in perpetuity tell you how i really feel that's what i should do i should just change the new show to and call it how i really feel and just pick a topic and start blasting people i think that should be a different show title <laughs> it'll be a different show yeah not this show i'm a little reined in here z says preach yeah rant i'll, I'll rant i don't know about preach it's too theological he said that they'd tune into that wow there you okay. go you got your first viewer <laughs> <laughs> just kind of like a how to start a movement right it right, isn't exactly. it isn't the person that's actually doing the discussion it's the first crazy person that follows z <laughs> will you be my first crazy person <laughs> if you've never seen this video um, go to YouTube and do a search for how to start a movement. <laughs> it's a really fun video. Um, it's a Ted talk and, um, it's easier just to, <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks Z. Z said they would. You're awesome. Okay. Well, that's it folks. Um, unfortunately, Mayor Watt has some mayoral duties to attend to and uh, some planning for tomorrow as well and uh, thanks for hanging out like always to close the show i am mayor watt that is hometown.com oh gosh that is hometown.com and up there is the visualizer for the ai you want to say bye z says have a good day both of you take care huge hug z thank you so much for coming and hanging out and spending the whole hour plus with us right yeah hour and a half my goodness time flies when we have a good time sorry go ahead ai is just staring <laughs> daggers at me good night i'm down citizens <laughs> thanks for hanging out with us z <laughs> <laughs> oh we'll see you tomorrow at 6 p.m eastern that's right cheers all thank you so much bye bye <laughs>